wonderful to be here today and to um, follow on from Tony's beautiful discussion this morning and then Colin's very encouraging presentation of the judgment, the investigative judgment. And uh, I think as he pointed out, we need not be afraid of that solemn tribunal. It's a, there's a, a beautiful passage that Ellen White writes that, that that solemn tribunal, which is the investigative judgment, overturns the decision of, uh, of God's people's enemies. <coughs> it doesn't judge against us, it only overturns the judgment against us. Mm -hmm. That certainly brings me a lot of comfort. Pardon? Oh, Mike. No, I actually heard that. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't comprehend it, but I heard it. <laughs> Um, so I'm not going to present anything deep today, I'm going to talk about what is our great hope. That um, sometimes we do get, not bogged down, that's not the right word, but we spend a lot of time in, in fairly deep stuff and I think it's just good to think about what is actually ahead of us. So before we start, shall we pray. Father in heaven, what a wonderful experience it is to be here, to come to you, to come to be with you in the appointed time, and this particular appointed time, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we can eat and digest the character of the only begotten Son of God. And in so eating, and so beholding, we want to become changed in that character. As I speak now uh, concerning the, the great hope of your children. I just pray that you would be with us, that your spirit would be over us, that your angels would be around us. In Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of my presentation is I Will Come Again. And ever since the beginning, ever since the fall, ever since Eve ate of the fruit and God made a promise, the great hope has been that Jesus will come. A Redeemer would come, a Deliverer. And we see in Genesis 3.15, God says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Here God is foretelling the coming of a Redeemer, somebody who is going to make it possible for man to be restored to the position that he had given away. In spite of all the prophecies in the Old Testament foretelling the first advent of the Son of God to this world, Israel was not ready to receive him in the manner that he would come. They were expecting a mighty warrior, an invincible leader, that would overthrow the Roman yoke 
and restore the nation to the national greatness that they've once enjoyed. So as a result, when the gentle teacher came, he was rejected by the nation and its leadership because he did not match up. Sorry? Yeah. Did not match up. Instead of coming as a warrior and a leader, Jesus came as a teacher and a healer. He came to show us both what the character of God is and what we can be like if we believe on that character and if we believe on him. He came to show us that man, when united with divinity, believing in the character of his God, could actually be changed into that same character. He also exposed to us and to the universe the true character of Satan. It was not for the purpose of God that his son would remain on earth forever after he had finished the work that he had come to do. And so when Jesus was talking with his disciples at the Last Supper, just before he was betrayed, we see in John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. And Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. So why is Jesus going away? To prepare a place. To prepare a place for whom? Us. Us, all of his disciples. Why is he coming again? Sorry? So that we can be where he is. So that we can be. When is Jesus coming again? Exactly. We're not told in the Bible. We're not told the timing of his coming. Though we were told the timing of the first advent through the prophecies, at least accurately enough so that the wise men actually came looking for him. They knew he was Jew. So there's plenty of prophecies in the Old Testament about the first coming. Uh, and as just as there are prophecies, prophecies of the first coming, there are also prophecies of his second coming. We read in Jude, even though it's in the New Testament, Jude chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, and it says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So according to that, Enoch was preaching the second coming of Jesus Christ. So it must have been common knowledge amongst the Israelites. There's no mention of any special revelation just to uh, Jude. So he's just repeating what all of Israel knew, that Enoch had prophesied the second coming of Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 25, Isaiah chapter 25, verses 8 and 9, it says, He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is a prediction of the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is a prediction or a prophecy of the fulfilment of the great hope. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27, Jesus himself is speaking and he says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus is speaking of himself. 
shall come in the glory of who? His Father. His Father. With his angels. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28, it says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. When being interrogated by the high priest, it's recorded in Mark chapter 14, verse 61 and 62, it says, But he held his peace, that's Jesus, and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And, you'll sh and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So the high priest was aware that the Blessed had a son. And he was challenging Jesus' claim to actually be that son. And when Jesus answered him, he said, You will certainly see me return, coming in the clouds of heaven. So there are many, many more uh, that tell us that even though Jesus returned to heaven almost 2,000 years ago, he will return at some point. And it is the great hope of Christianity. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, Jesus says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So we don't know, nor are we able to work out. There is nothing given for us to work out the day or the hour of Christ's coming. But we do know that it will happen. We do know that it is not far away. According to the various understandings put forward by Christianity in the world today, it ranges from Jesus having already returned in some mysterious spiritual way, to him returning soon at a date appointed, a date and a time appointed by God, or it's actually in the very distant future, coming at the end of a thousand years of peace and prosperity when the beast finally rises up and challenges God. Quite significant or significantly different understandings. Even in the Apostle Paul's day, there was confusion about this issue. People were expecting a speedy return. But Paul told them in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 3, he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. He's saying to them, don't be deceived. Don't be disturbed. Don't be troubled. He is not returning just yet. He says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So Paul is saying it's not yet. There's a lot to happen yet. And that there will be a falling away, and that the, son, the, the man of sin shall be revealed. And that, and that would happen before Jesus returned. The people at that time also had the prophecy of Daniel, some of which was understood in regard to the first advent. But it also shows that the day is a long way off. If people understood the prophecy, we knew that it was at least 1,800 years ahead of when Paul was speaking. We don't know whether Paul actually understood that or not, and at least he didn't say it. It is at least another 1,800 years, but he knew it wasn't soon in their time. The first advent happened just when it needed to be. The knowledge of God was rapidly declining in the world. Most of the world was pagan, had rejected God, had created their own gods and was worshipping them through all sorts of uh, rituals and, and manners. The Jews, the remnant of Israel, had almost completely apostatized from the truth about God. They had distorted the feasts distorted the sacrifices, offerings to the point that they were virtually entertainment to keep the masses entertained, busy doing things so that they wouldn't stop and think for themselves, which would potentially 
result in them rising up against the leadership. If Jesus had not come at that time, potentially there would have been nobody left to save. Satan had a very strong grip on the inhabitants of the world and into this world Jesus came to carry out his mission. It says in Galatians chapter 4 and verses 4 and 5, But when the fullness of time, fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So when the fullness of time, the fullness of the time, the appointed time, when God had ordained, preordained, he sent forth his Son. The prophecy of Jesus' first advent was fulfilled according to the time determined and prophesied for it. But as we've said, there is no time predicted for Jesus' second advent. God has not set a date. It is not like a game of hide and seek where God says, right, you've had enough time. I'm coming whether you're ready or not. We don't need to be afraid of that. Though I was <laughs> all of my life. I used to have dreams that uh, it would be dark and then the stars would start to fall and then the earth would convulse and I'd have this sick feeling inside my head that I wasn't about to live much longer. It was in dreams as a kid. So I'd obviously been listening to what we were taught at church. Why do we think God has set a date? Why do we think we could, God has set a time? We do. We, sorry? We do. Yes, but we think God is our judge. And as Colin has pointed out, God doesn't judge. He doesn't try or condemn or punish. Having completed his mission and then exposing Satan as a murderer, Jesus commissioned his disciples to carry on the work of preaching the good news. When the good news has been preached to all nations, that would be the time of Jesus' return. And we see in Matthew 24, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, Jesus speaking and he says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. But has this gospel been preached to all nations? We've been here for nearly 2,000 years. And he says, if this gospel is preached to all the world, the end would have come. But we're still here. But this gospel of the kingdom must still go to the whole world. And we know what that gospel is. And it is starting to go to the whole world. But while that is happening, while this message is getting out, Satan will be marshalling his forces and carrying out his plans to deceive the world before the second coming of Jesus. While we're not to be diverted from sharing our message, we should be aware at least of what Satan is up to. Not getting involved, not being too concerned about what the Pope is doing or Vladimir Putin or Joe Biden or even Scott Morrison, but at least aware of what's going on. Satan would have been very concerned by the preaching of the first angel's message. Because up until then, he knew he was pretty much in control. And suddenly, the first angel's message goes out. Fear God and give glory to him. From that message came the movement of Adventists and then the Seventh-day Adventists. I don't know about the early Adventists, but I know that most of those involved in the Millerite movement, if not all, and the early Seventh-day Adventists, all had a different understanding of who God is and who Jesus Christ is compared to what we would call the Christian denominations of that time. And they were not afraid to share this understanding of who God and Christ is. They were not afraid to share the mission of Christ but Satan would have been very disturbed by that. And he would have put in his best efforts to counteract this new reformation. When he could see that the movement was starting to understand that the commandments of God embraced more than just the Ten Commandments, and that they were looking at things like tithing and the health laws, 
he could see where that would lead. This was not a good sign. And so he was very active within the movement to cause division and disunity and to make sure that the people who needed to hear the message that was brought by Wagner and Jones and Mrs White in 1888, to ensure that that message was not understood or not accepted. Because if that message had been understood and accepted, it would have seen that the controversy was all about the law. What comprised the law? Or was the law done away with? And Satan was determined to prevent that light from, from continuing to grow. And we see this in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and he went to make more war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So the commandments of God encompass all of the commandments of God, as we said. And the testimony of Jesus... We think the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, but the whole Bible is the testimony of Jesus. His life on earth was his testimony. And of course the book of Revelation is the testimony of Jesus. So it's all of the testimony of Jesus. And Jesus made it clear he claimed to be the Son of God. And he said that he had finished the work that God had given him to do. So to believe, or to keep all the commandments of God, and to have all of the testimony of Jesus, or well, the people that have those things are the ones that Satan is going to make war with. We know that the commandments embrace the statutes and judgments, the book of the law, and that the testimony of Jesus is everything that he has said or inspired people to write and to say. Returning to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there shall come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The day will not come until that person is revealed. However, the revelation of that person is not the catalyst that brings on the second coming of Christ. <coughs> because it's the gospel being preached to all the world that is the catalyst. However, the day would come after the man of sin had been revealed. The man of sin, the son of perdition, was revealed during the Reformation with all of the prominent reformers identifying him for who he was and we are past that date in the stream of time. So it's clear that the, the revelation of the man of sin is not the catalyst for the return of Jesus Christ. So where are we now? Even though we don't know the hour or the day, we know where we are. Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through to 13 tell us, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. The beast from the earth has already risen. The beast from the earth is beginning to speak like a dragon, but has not yet caused the whole world to worship the first beast. So we know that we are sitting between the rising of the beast of the earth and the causing of all the world to worship that beast. We know that there will be very difficult times for the earth and its inhabitants and these times are yet to come. When they do come, we're told, <coughs> we're told in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. <coughs> and there will be a time of trouble such as never was since, since there was, an, since there was a nation, even to that same time. So what's just ahead of us is a time of trouble. 
but such as has never been. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, no, nor ever shall be. They're pretty frightening verses. And unless you know your God, you would be very fearful. But we don't need to be afraid of the time of trouble. For God has made promises to us about that specific time. And this is why it's so joyful for us. Not joyful because of the time of trouble, but joyful that God has addressed it and has assured us that we will be cared for. In Psalms chapter 27 and verse 5, it says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. So God's people will be hidden in God's pavilion during the time of trouble. And back to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. So it's not a time to be worried about, because God's people will be delivered. Well, the secret place of the Most High. The bosom of the Father, to know your God, to trust Him. Is that not? In Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14, John is speaking and he said, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, he's talking about a group of people, and he said to me, these are they which have come out of great tribulation. So God's people come out of the great tribulation. They don't need to be afraid of the tribulation because they're going to come out of it and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now the beast from the earth, and we know who that is, <coughs> will also deceive the dwellers on the earth by miracles and will eventually bring about a death penalty for all those who refuse the mark of the first beast. We know that that is ahead of us, that the death penalty is ahead of us. There is still much to happen. But we can draw comfort from the words of Jesus. In Matthew 24 and verse 6, he says, And you, sh you shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that ye be not troubled. So we don't need to be troubled. For these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And in Matthew 24 and verse 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And that is the great hope, that we shall be saved. God has graciously given us more comfort in the Psalms in chapter 91, verses 5 through to 8. And it says, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. There is no need to be afraid of these things. Nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Isn't that a wonderful promise? This is talking about end times. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. The promise is given to the people that are found in Psalms 91 verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And in verse 9, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall be no evil before thee, neither shall any plague come nigh their dwelling. Isn't that a fantastic promise? Like, you look ahead, you know the time of trouble, we all think, move to the country, grow my own food. If you're growing your own food, you're not going to keep it. People will come and take it, because nobody will have any food. Jesus tells us we don't need to be concerned for what we shall eat. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 29 and 30. And he says, And seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, 
and your Father knoweth that you have need of these things, and he will provide them. While all this trouble is going on, pestilence, wars, trouble, tribulation, God's people, the remnant, those who keep all of the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, continue to live as Jesus lived, not judging or condemning those about them, not passing judgment on people who are suffering, but just doing what they can to help. Showing kindness and compassion. They will pass through the time of trouble because they know their God. They know that God is exactly as he told us in Exodus chapter 34. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. They know their God because Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, and the Father is their God. As the time approaches for imposing a death penalty for those who have not received the mark of the beast, God's people are waiting for deliverance. They know what's happening. They can see it going on. They can see the hatred and the malice of the people around them. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 14 through to 18, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. This is the moment that the remnant have been waiting for. This is the fulfilment of the promise right from the beginning. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, a visible descent with a loud voice, and the dead in Christ shall rise. And those who are alive shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. In Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 9, it says, And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. It just fills my heart with joy as I go through these promises especially considering how concerned and fearful I was of the judgment, fearful of the tribulation and the time of trouble, and would I make it through it? But God has seen all that, and he's given it these wonderful promises. In the book, The Great Controversy, there is a wonderful chapter of encouragement, chapter 40, and it's called God's People Delivered. And if you haven't read it, I recommend reading it all the way through. Just a couple of sections that give us great encouragement this is why it tells us that graves are opened and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth awake some to everlasting life and some to shame shame and everlasting contempt and from Daniel 12 2 which is what she's quoting all who have died in the faith of the third angel's message come forth from the tomb glorified to hear God's covenant of peace with those who have kept his law. So we know that there's a special special res resurrection. And up until now, I've understood that it was the high priest and the soldiers. But I've missed the little bit that says, all who have died in the faith of the third angel's message. <coughs> so that means our friends and our relatives that have passed away during this time will actually be raised in a special resurrection. And they will see Jesus return. This is before the general res resurrection or the first resurrection of the dead. And we don't know how long before, but long enough that they will at least see the return of Jesus Christ. All who have died in the faith of the third angel's message come forth from the tomb glorified. 
they also which pierced him. Revelation 1.17 Those that mocked and derided Christ's dying agonies and the most violent opposers of his truth and his people are raised to behold him in his glory and to see the honour placed upon the loyal and the obedient. That's great controversy, page 637. And she says, Those who derided his claim to be the Son of God are speechless now. It would be a pretty awful time. Louder than the shout, crucify him, crucify him, which rang through the streets of Jerusalem, swells the awful despairing wail. He is the Son of God. He is the true Messiah. And I believe this passage applies to all who have denied that Jesus is the Son of God. All who are in a leadership position, all who have deceived somebody else about Jesus being the Son of God will experience the pain and the awful despairing wail that He is the Son of God. And as the fulfilment of all the predictions of the second coming of Jesus Christ and His own promise, sound of jet engines <laughs> and his own promise I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there ye may be also what a wonderful fulfillment and to be there the living righteous are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the voice of God they were glorified now they are made immortal, and with the risen saints are caught up to meet their Lord in the air. Angels gather together his elect from the four winds of heaven. Oh, sorry, from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Little children are born by holy angels to their mothers. Friends long separated by death are united, never more to part and with songs of gladness ascend together to the city of God. Can you even begin to imagine the joy that we will experience whether we live to that time or whether we are raised up to see that time? The joy of seeing dead loved ones arise or seeing people that we know, part of this movement, all translated, and rising up into the air and travelling and watching the earth recede beneath, watching the stars and planets go by, and as we travel to the city of God. I can't imagine it. I know it's going to happen. I believe it, but it will be wonderful. I pray that we all and all of our families we will be together on that great day. Something to keep before us. Something to think about even as we go about our daily lives. Praise God. I was going to sing when the role is called up yonder, but we've already sung it. Double blessing. close with Fred. Our wonderful Father in heaven, it is, it is just too good for us to comprehend that the promise made back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden is so close to fulfilment. As Mrs. White said to us, when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them for his own. The promise will be fulfilled. The work is before us. But you have to do that work. You have to reproduce the character of your son in us so that we can display it to the world. And we believe that you are doing it now. Thank you, Father, for your love. Thank you for the joy of knowing that we will be preserved through the time of trouble, that we need not fear that you will be with us always, even to the end. In Jesus' name.
Home. 